Follow us on social media and please hit the subscribe button so you don't miss out on any updates from our ALS experts. Well, see, sometimes folks, we, um, we get a little bit ahead of ourselves because we want to make sure everybody's taken care of. And me, I want to make sure that each one of you who have shown up tonight realizes that you are so important to us and to each person that you see here, because there's not one day that goes by that somebody doesn't have a question about what's happening to them. And there's so many of us that I'm sure one of us has an yes. answer to that question. So if you show up, that means that we're doing what we call our passion. And that is each one of you, because each one of us knows exactly, not exactly, because everybody's going through this differently, but we know in general what everybody is experiencing. And that's why we farmed everything ALS, because we need a place to gather. It's like the water hole. There's a lot of dry area out there, but it's not dry here. So please bring what you have, take home what you receive and spread it around and let's do it again and again and again, because we're not getting tired. We're getting full of passion actually, because we're getting closer and closer to early detection, which is one of the great attributes of everything ALS. So welcome aboard. I'm glad to be here because I know that you're here. Thank you from everybody who's here tonight. And for all of you who aren't here tonight and you see this later, that's why we put this into our library. So it'll never be lost. Everything that we collect tonight will be gathered and put away in a safe place so you can join us when it's your time. Thank you. You know, folks, Sometimes you think you don't have a lot of time, but when you have uh, a family like this, we have a lot of time because we're not gonna give up until it's over with. And it seems like we are not at the beginning. We're not in the middle. We're not at the end. We're just where we should be because our dedication to what we're doing, it lasts 24 hours a day, seven days a week, although we do sleep but we do think and breathe trying to find comfort and some solution to the daily needs because until there's a cure, there are daily needs. <laughs> this, is, we, this is the time in life, I'm 70 years old. There is nothing more important to me than laughing, loving and eating good food. And the next thing, if I do those three things, then I'll be available to come and laugh and sing and play with you all. Now we haven't sang together, but I think that we're going to have a choir one night. We're going to come up with a song and we're going to sing it together. Now I'm not sure which one it is. I'm not sure when we're going to do it, but I got it in the back of my mind. And when I see all these smiles, I know that there's a lot of soul inside. So what more can I say, but every day, wake up, look in the mirror, check out who's looking back at you, get really friendly, say hi, what are we up to today? And then if you really need somebody to talk to that you want to tell a little lie to, tell it to yourself and see what happens because you can't lie to yourself. I tried it before. I spend a lot of time in front of the mirror because I like to come and visit myself. And one day I tried to say, you know, I did something that I didn't do really. And my little self said to me, McFinn, let's just talk about what you really did and what you really believe in. So if you get afraid sometime, go talk to yourself. There's always somebody there to listen to you. I spent, I spent a lot of time in my wheelchair looking in the mirror. And I had a friend looking back at me. Sometimes it was scary and sometimes it was just pure company. So you never know what you're gonna get into when you become honest 
honesty is a really interesting subject. So stay honest with yourself. You keep to, uh, it, it, it'll keep you interested in your life story. And with that, let's make this evening something to take home. And it could be later on tonight when we all get together and we start talking about those things that are personal to us. Be sure to bring out whatever is the deepest personal issue that you have because you have the deepest, most interesting people listening to you. And there just might be an answer coming straight back to you. Love is thick and we share it well. Thank you, folks. Really appreciate you all coming tonight and every time that you come because what are families for? It's called family get together. And that's what we're for. Thank you so much for that, McFinn. Um, and welcome everyone to our Everything ALS Wednesday webinar series. We're super excited to bring the experts to your living room. So thanks for being here tonight. I'm Lisa Deegan and I'm part of the Everything ALS team because uh, my younger brother was an ALS warrior from 2014 to 2018. So our goal here at Everything ALS is really to provide you all with resources and things that we didn't have when we were going through our journeys. So tonight we're honored to have Dr. Jonathan Cooper Knock from University of Sheffield, who's gonna be presenting on an unbiased study of blood metabolites that links novel and familiar compounds to the risk of ALS. Before we get started really quick, for anybody who's new tonight, I just wanted to quickly share something that we at Everything ALS are doing to help end ALS. So we're conducting the largest digital biomarker voice study that aims to get an earlier diagnosis and a better understanding of the course of ALS. So with everybody's help, we can, we'll be able to discover and validate digital biomarkers to help improve the success rate in clinical trials, to help measure effectiveness of therapies, and also accelerate treatments. So please visit everythingals.org forward slash research to learn more and sign up today. It only takes about five to 10 minutes of your time and we're looking for healthy participants, especially males or those diagnosed with ALS or PLS. So our study is also eye gaze compatible. So thank you for listening and for your consideration to helping us all end ALS together. So um, for tonight's presenter, um, as I mentioned, we had Dr. Jonathan Cooper Knock, who is a renowned, who's renowned for his research in ALS, genetic, causes and the discovery of novel genetic mutations for identifying new potential therapeutic targets. He is leading investigation of non-coding genome in the largest ever disease specific whole genome sequencing project, which is focused on ALS. He's helping to pave the way towards better clinical trials. He is an early house member that has helped update an outdated guideline for better trial design and to conduct trials that improve access to treatments and that will come sooner and faster to patients. In 2017, he was awarded the European Network for Cure of ALS Young Investigator Award. So please join me in welcoming from the UK where it's quite late, Dr. Jonathan Cooper Knock. We appreciate not only your research and your work in ALS, but your dedication to sharing your work with our community here tonight. Welcome. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, everybody. Um, it's an absolute pleasure to be here. Right. So I'm going to share my screen and let's let's we've tested this, so it should work. Um, so can you can you see my screen? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Yeah, yeah. Fantastic. Um, so yeah, so I'm Jonathan Cooper Knock. So I'm from Sheffield in the UK. Um, so you know, I'm a neurologist, so I'm a clinician as well, but but also a geneticist. And I'm going to share to you, share with you some of our work this evening. This evening here, um, I guess this afternoon, with some of you guys, looking at um, metabolites in ALS uh, within the blood and sort of linked to risk of ALS. But I'll give you a bit of a kind of a, a whistle stop tour of how I got there as well, because um, this is a, as Lisa says, you know, we're we're predominantly um, I, my group predominantly works on genetics of ALS, and and so this is kind of a little bit of a, a deviation for us. So, you know, 
genetics of ALS, we know from twin studies that sort of the, the heritability of ALS is, is kind of largely not understood, you know, so there are lots of genetic risks to be understood. And, you know, most of my work actually focuses on kind of trying to understand the genetic architecture of ALS. Um, but it turns out you can use genetics not only to, to look at genes, but, but also you can tag things in the environment with genetics. Now, that's quite a hard concept to get your head around, but, but think of it just like a tag. So I'm gonna tag something in the environment. So you could say smoking or exercise or, or anything else. You could tag it with genetics, measure it with genetics, and then use that to look at how that thing in the environment affects risk of ALS. Um, so, so that's what we did. Now, I got to this because we were looking at exercise, physical exercise. Again, this is not, not the focus of my talk, um, but I'm gonna get just, it helps to sort of introduce the techniques. But obviously, feel free to ask me questions on this at the end, because um, I know this is, might be of interest to some people. So, so we looked at physical exercise. Now, it, it, I'm sure many of you are aware that, you know, for a long time, we've known that there's, you know, lots of prominent sports people who've developed ALS, you know, all over the world. And there's been this open question, you know, is it does exercise link to the risk of ALS? Or does, is it just that exercise protects you against other things like cardiovascular disease? And therefore you see more people with ALS that have done lots of exercise because they're protected against other things. So, so that, that was kind of a bit of an open question, but this, this genetic tagging idea, which is really comes down to a technique called Mendelian randomization. Um, we, could, we could use Mendelian randomization to, to measure exercise and then look at its effect on risk of ALS. So, so we did that. Um, and, and what we found is that frequent strenuous exercise, the more frequent strenuous exercise you do, the, the higher your risk of ALS. So, so it's a, and the line, you know, this line shows it's a directly proportional line. This is just a cartoon, but, but it illustrates the point that there's, that there's a, a linear relationship and it is directly proportional. We published this a couple of months ago. Now, I, again, I, like I say, it's not the focus of the talk. And well, the caveat I want to add here is that this is a population level study. So at a population level, Ex, you know, more exercise leads to higher risk of ALS. But what we don't know at the moment is which individuals this is relevant for and which individuals it's not. So we're not recommending that anybody changes their exercise habits until we can say for you as an individual, this is the effect of exercise on your risk of ALS. You know, I, we know exercise is beneficial. It's, it, you know, for many, many things. So I'm not telling anybody to stop exercising, you know, and I think that particular, I've had lots of questions uh, after this study from people who have maybe have family members with ALS or, you know, and, and we're not telling anybody to stop exercising because exercise is good for you. But, but, but you know, this, this, what this study did for us is it established that this is a real relationship. And now we're, we, we, you know, we're going all out to find these individuals who are at risk. So we can then say, look, you know, this is your risk. This is, you know, this is what exercise is good for. This is what might be bad for. And then give people individualized counseling so they can make their own decisions about their own life. Um, but so, yeah, I just want to say that caveat. But so going forwards with my main Thing I've come to talk about today. So Mendelian randomization, as I said, so it's a technique using genetics to tag things in the environment. So, and, and you can tag exercise, but you could also tag things called metabolites. Now, what are metabolites? So this is, a, I found quite a good definition, I think. So intermediate and end products of cellular regulatory processes. Um, and so the examples sort of amino acids, fatty acids, lipids, carbohydrates, you know, all those things in your blood that are not cells, that are, that, that are sort of uh, molecules that, but are used by cells, produced by cells, and maybe, you know, taken on by cells. So, so they're kind of, and, and we know that they're important for cellular processes. So, you know, by definition, then they could be important for things that are involved in ALS. So what, what we set out to do here was to um, look, use Mendelian randomization to tag all of these different metabolites using genetics, and then look to see if we, if the, uh, levels of these metabolites affected risk of ALS. So we did this, but um, and, and the way we did this, we didn't want to just test one metabolite because that's quite limited. Um, we wanted to test all metabolites or in one study. So we used, we, we, we benefited from these two studies that were published previously, where they basically, put, they did genetic studies of metabolites. So that gave us a tool to tag every single, you know, up to a thousand different metabolites using genetics. So that then we could test where the levels of these metabolites were linked to risk of ALS. I hope, I hope that makes sense. Um, so, but the basic idea is we're, we're testing a thousand different metabolites all at once to see if they affect risk of ALS. Now, 
you, you'll probably point out there's a problem here. So if I'm going to do a thousand different tests, my likelihood of getting a false positive test goes up a lot. OK, so you have to be. So this kind of analysis is very powerful and um, we call it an unbiased screen. And, and, it, and it's had tremendous results in fields of, in the field of genetics for, in lots of diseases. But, but the disadvantage is that you have to you have to be aware that your risk of a false positive is higher and then correct for that. And so what we do is we set a very high threshold for significance so that if I'm calling something significant, it, it's got to be you know, more than I could expect by chance by doing a thousand statistical tests. Um, I hope that makes sense. So when we do the screen of these thousand different metabolites, this is, this is the basic result. So let me explain this graph to you a little bit. So every dot is a metabolite, okay? So represents a test. Um, and then on the x-axis, we've kind of got, you know, this, this line here is defined by the x-axis, this straight line. And this is kind of what we'd see if we did a thousand tests and none of them were significant, um, by chance, we'd get p-values, you know, level test, the results would sit on this line, basically. And you can see most of the most of the metabolites we test do sit on this line. You know, they're not significantly different from what we'd expect by chance. But but that's good. You know, we, you know, in this, we wouldn't expect all metabolites to affect risk of ALS. We'd expect it to be just a couple. So, th so that's quite good. That's quite reassuring that we're not getting a, it's not, a, the test is not inflated is the word for it. But what we do see is some metabolites deviate a lot from this line. They're a lot more significant than we'd expect by chance. And if we set this kind of uh, Bonferroni multiple testing correction, so this is this is a very very stringent correction. And and you know if you look in the in the scientific literature, things that pass Bonferroni correction are usually reproducible. So so that's why it's a really useful uh, a useful line. And and these three metabolites cross that line, so they are they're very very significant. And so so you know that's what we've taken forwards from this to to go and have a look at them now. So blue is protective. And red is harmful. So I'm going to I'm going to talk you through these three um, and explain you know how we're interpreting them and how we're taking them forwards. So the first one is is this estrone three sulfate. So so this is protective. So so again now in this graph that what I'm showing that I'm showing you here, each dot is a is a and we call it a SNP. So it, it's like a it's think of it as just a genetic variant. So but but um what we see is that SNPs that have a higher, that, that correspond to higher levels of estrone 3 sulfate correspond to lower levels of ALS risk. So there's higher levels of estrone 3 sulfate, lower ALS risk. And that passes lots of sort of quality control measures. And then when we run the whole thing in a completely separate test, it, it also checks out. So this looks very, very robust. And you can see, look, you know, there's, there's, if you take out any one of these SNPs, you'd, you'd still get the same relationship. And um, these these lines all would still follow the same pattern, and and we tested that, and that is the case. So so does this make sense? So estrogen three sulfate, what is it? Well, it, it turns out it's a precursor of an estrogen, and and we know that males are at higher risk of ALS than females. The ratio, the sex ratio of ALS is about one point six men to for every one female. So this makes sense. Um, the the higher levels of estrogen are that which you find in females are protective against ALS. Now. It doesn't mean that females never get ALS, of course, but it does mean, but this is consistent with what we see that there is a slightly higher risk in males compared to females. So, so we saw that as reassuring, you know, we, we've done this kind of screen of these, all these different metabolites, we've got a lot of data, there, but the results we're getting, you know, our top hit makes sense. So what about the next one? So bradykinin. Now, bradykinin, um, again, this is a protective relationship. So higher levels of bradykinin correspond to lower level, lower risk of ALS. Um, and, and again, this fits with what we find in the literature. So bradykinin, so many of you will be familiar with the ACE inhibitors such as ramapril and lisinopril. These are drugs that are commonly used for treatment of high blood pressure. But one of the things they do is they inhibit the degradation of bradykinin. So, and I, I don't know if you've, any of you have experienced this, but sometimes people who take ACE inhibitors get a dry cough. That's caused by bradykinins. Um, and there was this study from, uh, go back 2015, a very good study from Taiwan, where they, they looked at the risk of ALS in people who were or were not taking ACE inhibitor drugs. And what they found is that um, if people were taking ACE inhibitors for more than four years, there was a 57% reduction in risk of ALS. Now, that, that sounds a lot, but bearing in mind in the general population, the risk of ALS is relatively low. So a 50% reduction, 57% uh, 
uh, of something that's low is still quite low. So, so it's not a massive change, but it is significant. But again, it's consistent with what we're finding here that, that you know, and they proposed it in the paper, you know, completely before we ever came across this idea, that the way that the ACE inhibitors are acting maybe by leading to, high, you know, inhibiting degradation, so leading to higher levels of bradykinin. So again, that, that fits with what we're seeing. We see our, our result tells us that bradykinin is protective and that's consistent with the literature. So then that brings us to the third one, so isoleucine. Now, what we saw here was a harmful effect. So higher levels of isoleucine, higher risk of ALS. And again, each of these dots is a, is a single genetic variant. And you'll look at this graph and you'll tell me that, well, if you get rid of that one, then everything just is noise. And um, it's not quite true. So if you, we've we tried that, because that was my thought as well. You we remove that. And if you zoom in, the relationship is still statistically significant. So it meets all the quality control measures. And again, when we repeat the whole thing in an entirely different data set, it still holds up. So, so you know, we're satisfied that this looks like a robust result. Um, but isoleucine is very interesting. So isoleucine is a branch chain amino acid. And um, many of you will be familiar with branch chain amino acids. So basically there's valine, leucine and isoleucine. And, and actually, if you go back to the 90s, there was two, well, several, but two particular clinical trials where they tried to use branch chain amino acids to actually treat ALS. But, but what's interesting from our perspective, you know, remember I'm, our data says that isoleucine is harmful. Um, one of these trials, this is a paper from 1993 from Italy, um, one of the trials showed excess mortality in, in subjects who were uh, randomized to having ice, for having branched chain amino acids. So people who were taking the branched chain amino acid treatment um, actually had excess mortality compared to those taking placebo. So it was bad for you basically. And as a result, they terminated the trial. And then another clinical trial found a very similar result. So people taking the branched chain amino acids, their respirate, their breathing function uh, deteriorated at twice the rate of those taking placebo. So again, consistent with branched chain amino acids being harmful. A, a caveat here. So, you know, I don't want you all to sort of, you know, we all need branched chain amino acids in our diet. They're important for lots of things and, uh, you know, I, the treatment group in this in these trials had a blood concentration that is you know more than a hundred times the normal range so you know none of you are going to have any kind of blood concentration approaching what they were getting in this clinical trial but i think from what i what i want the reason i mention it is because you know again it, it fits with what we're finding that isoleucine is potentially harmful and I, i'll i'll talk about so somebody's raised a hand um I can, I can, I'm happy to take a question now, or, or do I wait to the end? I, whatever you Let's wait think. till the end to ask questions, okay. so we will save that for then. Yeah. Thank you. All right, okay. So, so, so this is consistent with the idea that isoleucine is, is increases risk of ALS. So, and then there's another trial, um, uh, another, another study from slightly more recently. So this is from a, a group at Harvard in 2019. So, so they'd seen the branched chain amino acid clinical trials. And so they, they looked at this in a slightly different way. So what they used was a, a cohort of, of a population cohort and um, not selected for ALS. But within that cohort, a small number of people, about 50 or so, developed ALS. And so, but they, in this cohort, they could, me they had measurements of uh, branched chain amino acids in the blood. And, and what they, their overall conclusion was that there wasn't an effect of these branched chain amino acids on ALS risk. But actually, if you examine the data, um, isoleucine, not the others, there's no signal in leucine and valine. I'll come back to that. But, um, but for isoleucine, in people where the, they had a higher level and the measurement was within five years of their diagnosis of ALS, then there was the highest sort of risk that was found in the study. Still negative, um, but it was higher than found in, you know, in any other part of the study. So, um, and, and what I think what, what this comes to is a, another real advantage. One of the reasons we're doing Mendelian randomization as a technique is because it's very powerful. So this study, you know, they had thousands of people, but only maybe 50 or so people with ALS. Mendelian randomization, you can measure your exposure, the isoleucine, and you can measure and your outcome in different cohorts. So you don't need to have people where you have both measurements. And that really massively increases your power. You know, so, so for, for the test that we did, we had tens of thousands of people where we'd measured isoleucine and tens of thousands of people where we, we knew about their ALS. So dramatically more power. Um, but I think, you know, what I would say looking at this study is whilst it, 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 it on, on the surface, it disagrees with us. If you actually examine the data, it's not inconsistent with what we found. Um, now, so what, what's actually happening here? So, you know, 
you know, we care about mechanism. If we want to design treatments, we need to know about mechanism. So, you know, it, it's not enough to just say, oh, we found a, a link. We want to understand what we're looking at and how do we reverse it, prevent it, etc. So branched chain amino acids. So I said there's leucine, isoleucine and valine, three of them. And this is their sort of metabolic pathway. They are sort of processed. Every every sort of word here is an enzyme. Um, sorry, every every box is an enzyme and every sort of line is a kind of an intermediate product. So when you start with isoleucine, it gets metabolized through all these different stages by these different enzymes and eventually it ends up in the TCA cycle and process for energy. So, so that's interesting. Now, the thing I haven't told you yet is that we also tested leucine and we also tested valine. Now, the valine test was underpowered, so I, I don't really feel confident to say anything about valine. Um, Leucine, we got a very good test and it was entirely negative. So isoleucine was harmful. Leucine was just no signal at all. And that's really interesting. Leucine and isoleucine are chemically very, very similar. But, but you know, it, this got me interested in, well, where are they different? And if you look at the differences in their metabolism, the obvious thing is that isoleucine gets processed through this part of the pathway, whereas leucine never gets over here, okay? Whereas isoleucine goes into both, both these arms, uh, uh, leucine doesn't go anywhere near this. And if you look at this part of the pathway, then, then vitamin B12 is consumed in this, by this enzyme, this mutase, um, when, it, when it's uh, converting methyl mononyl coa into succinyl coa. So B12 is consumed now, and we know this, this is, this is known in the literature. In fact, one of the tests for B12 deficiency is to load with isoleucine because it consumes B12. So, so what we wondered then is that maybe the reason isoleucine is toxic and leucine isn't toxic is because it consumes B12. So higher isoleucine, lower B12, okay? And, and, and you know, vitamin B12, I'll, I'll, I'll talk a bit more about that. It's not, a, not necessarily a new idea, but this link between isoleucine and B12 in the context of ALS is quite new. Um, backing this up, what we found is that in very rare individuals who have mutations in this enzyme, which reduces its activity, so less consumption of B12, they actually have a lower risk of ALS. Um, this, these are rare mutations, and we, we had to look at thousands of people to get this data. But it, again, it's consistent with this idea that, that, that this consumption of B12 by this enzyme is harmful. Um, so, so then you think, okay, so if that's true, all right, and, and isoleucine is toxic because it's consuming B12. Well, then B12 itself should be protective. You know, you should see a protective effect of vitamin B12. And actually that is what you see. So higher levels of vitamin B12 um, you lead to lower risk of ALS, but this didn't beat all of our, our very stringent uh, statistical tests. This didn't beat it until we were going in with a very clear hypothesis, because then we can, we can, we, you know, we've got a higher a, a pre-test probability. So, so, but when you look at it, vitamin B12, it does look like it's protective just as we hypothesized. But if you look at this graph, I, I'm not really happy with this graph. It, it does pass some of the quality control measures, but it's a bit messy. You know, if I remove this snip here, then, then it, it doesn't look so good. And, and, and there's something called, um, it, with Mendelian randomization, you worry if your SNPs are very heterogeneous, and these two are very, very different. Um, it suggests that maybe the test is not so valid. Um, but then if you look at holotranscobalamin, now holotranscobalamin is an active form. Basically, it's what happens when, you're, when you're, the body wants to use B12, it, it, it sort of converts it into holotranscobalamin. It's the active form of B12. And then you see a very strong relationship. So lots of data, very strong protective effect, it meets all of the quality control measures, significant in multiple data sets, much more robust. And that makes sense. You know, when you look at the active form of something, you'd expect to see a stronger signal than in the non-active form. It makes sense. Um, and then what we did, we used something called multivariate MR um, Mendelian randomization. So multivariate Mendelian randomization. And, and you don't need to understand this, but, but the key to it is that when we correct the isoleucine experiment for B12, whether in its non-active or active form, then it, it becomes non-significant. So what does that mean? That means that isoleucine is only toxic it, when, you, when you include uh, depletion of vitamin B12. And if you control for the level of B12, then the isoleucine signal disappears. So this is, this is really good evidence that the way that isoleucine toxicity is acting is through depletion of vitamin B12. So, so you know, we, were, we were really pleased with that result because it, it was very robust. 
um, and, it, and it suggests that we're getting very close to the mechanism. So what about vitamin B12? It, it, you know, people have, it, we're not the first people to come up with vitamin B12, although this mechanism is new. Um, you know, there's been a clinical trial of high dose um, vitamin B12, so methylcobalamin, just another name for that. And this, this, this study, um, it was a negative study. So this was using it as a treatment in people who have ALS. Um, and it was a negative study. However, when they sort of went back and looked at the data, it, it, focusing on people who were sort of early in their disease process, then, then the results were significant. Now, the caveat here is that any any retrospective analysis of clinical trial data has to be taken with a pinch of salt because you don't know how many tests they did. And, you know, I was talking about that sort of, if you run a thousand tests, you might get one that's significant. Um, you, you know, you've got to be very careful with these, you know, these, these, these kind of analyses, but it is, you know, if you believe it, then it's very consistent with what we're saying. And remember, with our study of the metabolites is looking at lifetime levels of isoleucine and B12, whereas this study is looking at giving B12 just for a limited period. So what are our conclusions? Where do we get from all this that I've talked you through? So I, I think that um, isoleucine is toxic in at-risk individuals. That, that, that's you know, that, that's our kind of conclusion. But I want to I want to emphasize this at risk individuals. This is this is you know it's similar to what I said with the exercise. What we don't understand is exactly who is at risk. You know this is a population level result, and what I can't tell you is that you know the, the person you know this individual is at risk of isoleucine induced ALS. So I think you know at the moment we would we you know and that's where we go from here is we try and find those individuals to sort of provide that information. But at the moment, we wouldn't advise people to change their diet um, because we don't know who's at risk. And what we don't want is people to suffer from not having branched chain amino acids in their diet. Um, we do, I, I am sure of this, that isoleucine toxicity acts via depletion of vitamin B12. And I do think that, you know, we could say that vitamin B12 is beneficial, particularly in people who have higher isoleucine. And, you know, and where we take this forwards is to try and, you know, find these people at risk and give vitamin B12. Vitamin B12 is, is cheap, it's safe, um, and, and you know our data would suggest it's beneficial. So, so, so that's what I have. Obviously, I take questions. Oh, yeah, that just to say. So the thing we what I didn't say to you is that where isoleucine is metabolized predominantly is, is, is not actually in the central nervous system. It's pre metabolized predominantly in sort of muscle and, and liver. Um, and what we think is happening there is that, you know, the isoleucine is metabolized peripherally and then it affects the level of B12, which then gets into the central nervous system. It, what that means is to kind of prove this in an, in an experimental model, you need, you need a whole organism. And so where we're going at the moment, so all of this data I've showed you is unpublished, but the, what we're doing at the moment is, is, is sort of, is, you know, validating the mechanism in zebra fish. Um, and zebrafish have the advantage that you can see the central nervous system as it develops. Um, but yeah, and so I just want to give credit to people I work with in Sheffield, particularly uh, Pam Shaw, um, who's our head of institute, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with um, as, as you know, a, clini a leading clinician in the field um, and researcher. And then also, so our close collaborators in, in Stanford. So Mike Snyder, I work very closely with and Sai Zhang, who's one of his postdocs. Um, you know, and I mentioned that most of my work is, you know, in collaboration with these guys is looking at the genetic architecture of ALS. Um, and then finally, just thank you to funders. So um, we mentioned, I think already we've talked about Project Mind, Project Mind, big whole genome sequencing consortium doing a lot of great work. Um, welcome who pay my wages. And then I just wanted to, you know, ALL, ALS Cure Project. So Mike Piscotti, I believe is, is maybe even here. Um, you know, uh, Mike's a great guy and he's supported us um, in our work. Um, and thank you for listening. And I'm happy to take questions. I hope that was useful. Well, thank you, uh, Dr. Kubernak. Uh, like I said earlier, my name is Sarah. I'm one of the Everything ALS hey, members. Um, I am joined because um, my dad was an ALS warrior as well uh, with Lisa's brother. Um, and so very interested and passionate and now have decided to go back to school after being a nurse for a long time to uh, start this process and go to medical school and, and join the uh, fight for ALS. So thank you again for coming and speaking with us. Myself, as well as Pooja, have a few questions for you that have been in the chat, as well as questions that people emailed in before. Um, so we'll get started. The first question kind of talks about what you spoke to in the end of your presentation with the fish, but what would the next steps look like specifically in a, humans and people with ALS? 
Yeah, really good question. So, so I think you know we are doing some work to sort of validate this an experimental model, but the experimental models are not are not perfect either. You know, one of the things I like about genetics is that you know these are these are tests on on lots of people you know that have lots of power and and i think you know i've already, i showed you some of the results we had and why i think they make sense so i think you know there, there's that we can take this forward as it is and um, you know in terms of what we do yeah our focus is to like i said with the exercise but also with this is to find the at-risk individuals what i'd like to do is is find people who are at risk of of having you know who high eye solution is definitely bad for and then give them b12 that'd be what i'd like to do because i think it would probably do them some good so i, I you know I, that's where we go with with this uh, yeah is, is to go after that um doing it on an individual level basis what does that look like i think eventually that looks like a prospective study so so recruiting people prospectively measuring their isoleucine measuring their metabolites and then trying to predict who you know develops als and who doesn't um, and 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 you know if you can predict it then you can you know then you're sure that you're getting it right and i guess the final thing to say is that probably we're looking at you know it, you know, what determines whether an individual is at risk of, say, you know, isoleucine induced ALS or exercise induced ALS is probably genetics. So I think what we need to do here is integrate the ge genetics with the environment. Um, if that makes sense. Thank you. Our next question kind of leads off of that. And it's do you believe genetics plays a role in both sporadic as well as familial cases of ALS, um, kind of tying into identifying those at risk groups? Yeah, great, great question. So, so we do know that if you so clearly if you, you know, sporadic ALS, you by definition don't have a family history. So, you know, your your family members are at low risk of ALS. You know, but what we do know is that their risk is higher than the background. So it's 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 still low, but it's higher than it would be if you didn't have a family member with ALS. So so, and I think you know what explains that. Yeah, you know, and that and and twins. The reason I showed pictures of twins at the beginning is because twin studies would back me up on this. Twin studies of of sporadic ALS show that there is a significant genetic component. Now. Again, I emphasize if you have a, you know, if you sporadic ALS, the risk is is low if you're a family member, we have a family member with sporadic ALS. But I think there is there is a risk there. And by understanding that, then perhaps we can we can better understand the disease and design treatments and prevent ALS. And that, that that's where we're aiming for. Um, and that kind of plays into our next question. So this is working out great. Um, how do you feel that your research that you've done and, and are currently working on can affect people that are currently going through ALS or experiencing now? Are they able to participate? Is there some way that they can get involved? What can they do as people who are a lot of the community on this, this call is, is currently um, fighting their battles? Yeah, no, absolutely. Really good question. So we are putting together, you know, I talked about these kind of prospective studies. Um, you know, I think for any prospective study like that has to involve, uh, you know, patients and family members. And, and, and you know, I, what I would, we're, we're putting together a study at the moment, and, and I may well come back to you with that, um, you know, particularly, particularly around the exercise, actually, initially, and then we'll move on to the metabolite stuff. So um, I may well come back to you on that. So yes, there's lots, we, lots we can do to help. Um, in terms of, you know, yeah, yeah, lots you can do to help. Okay. And, and I just wanted to add uh, um, that I'm, I'm Indu Navar from Everything ALS. We're working very closely with the Snyder Lab as well. So we're trying Fantastic. to come up with some research together. Cool. Thank you. I look forward to it. Yeah, yeah. Our next question is a quick technical one about the initial study describing the correlation between exercise and ALS. What was the study's definition of strenuous exercise? Yeah, really good question. So, yeah, you guys have good questions. So, so the, 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 to maximize power, this came from a questionnaire where it said sort of strenuous was defined, you know, it, it left it kind of open. Um, uh, but, but I think, uh, you know, what does that give you? So by leaving it open, you get more, you, you sort of enrich for anaerobic exercise, I think is where it goes but it wasn't defined precisely so that you kind of maximized your capture. Does that make sense? So, so I believe it's not a pure measure, but I think it's enriched for anaerobic exercise. And the reason we, we actually went in with the hypothesis that anaerobic, that anaerobic strenuous exercise would be key. And the reason we did that is because we know that motor neurons supplying sort of fast twitch muscle fibers are the most vulnerable to ALS. So, so our, our hypothesis was that the, 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 it was that kind of exercise that would be most harmful. Um, so, so yeah, that, that's, that's kind of, yeah. So it was very loosely defined, 
but it, but I think what we're looking at is strenuous anaerobic exercise that's frequent as well I should say. Um, kind of tying into the, the how that led to your metabolite study do you think that these um, metabolites could also show some level of protectiveness after um, the diagnosis so um, people with who may still take the ACE inhibitors or um, even ingesting more B12? Yeah, great question. So, well, I mean, I guess if you look at the um, the vitamin B12 clinical trial I mentioned, you know, obviously that, that again, I, that was a, a negative result, but but there's a hint in there that it was beneficial. Um, I, I, you know, I think, it, you know, if I was sat in clinic having that question, I would say, you know, that there, there seems to be B12 is definitely not bad for you. Um, and it appears like it can be good for you. Um, but, but I couldn't say, you know, for definite, this is the effect on you as an individual that that's where we're aiming for. Um, but yeah. Our next question uh, regards the valine metabolic pathways, since that also appeared to feed into the B12 uh, yeah. pathway. Could you explain a little bit about those results? Yeah, good, great question. So, um, the answer is we do see signal in that pathway, but the power is, I've not shown the result because it's underpowered. So to, to, to be able to use Mendelian randomization, you have to have a tool that captures enough of the variation in that trait. Um, and, and if the tool doesn't, imagine you're trying to tag something with a genetic tag. If the tag's not very good, then your measure is not very accurate. Okay, so I don't I don't trust the valine result really because it, it's underpowered. Um, but but there is so the, yes, there is some signal in that pathway. There is a, one of the intermediates does look like it's harmful exactly as we see for isoleucine. Um, but but you know our focus has been on isoleucine because that's where we have the most power to make a comment. I, I you know I, I struggle to make a comment about the valine pathway um, that I'm confident in. Um, that was actually one of my questions, so that <laughs> clarifies a lot. Uh, the next question kind of talks about how to go finding at-risk populations, more of a general than specific. Um, I know specifically genetic tests, and you talked about the SNPs. Mm -hmm. First off, for those that don't know, could you explain kind of what that is a little bit more? But yeah. what does that look like, whole genome sequencing for the entire population of the ALS community? I think, I think what, yeah, so, so how would I do this? So, so I think... What I would like to do, you know, measure the measure the levels of the uh, isoleucine, um, so you can get an idea of of kind of, you know, uh, the the spectrum amongst patients and family members. Measure the genetics, and then look to see is there any correlation. So, do you see specific genetic background? So, you know, specific, uh, uh, you know, a specific genome that appears to lead to ALS combined with high levels of isoleucine, or maybe do you see you know, certain individuals where they have isoleucine, it's very high, but because of their genetics, they appear to be protected. Does that, does that make sense? So, so then by, by if, you, if you imagine it, it's like you've got the isoleucine is one half of the puzzle. We need to understand the genetics is the other half of the puzzle. And we need to kind of line them all up to work out who's at risk and who's not. And um, what you need for that is power. And um, you need a lot of people and you need a lot of, um, uh, you, you, you don't have the, the advantage of MND randomization is that you can use separate cohorts. When you start to do the individual level risk, you, you can't use separate cohorts. You need large numbers of people where you have isoleucine and genetics. Um, you, you mentioned, sorry, so you said, uh, explain a little bit about genetics. So SNPs, um, if you think everybody has sort of, uh, you know, we know our genome, if we think of our, our genome has lots of genes in it, but it, but actually it has a lot more than that. Genes are about 1% of your genome and your entire genome is, is sort of, I, I'm sure you've all seen sort of letters, you know, uh, A, T, C, G, and um, every single one of those letters, uh, if it changes, we call it a SNP. So we, we talk about a reference uh, code. And then if it's different, if you, all of us have lots of bits of our genome, which are completely different to the reference. And, and then we'd call that a SNP. I hope that makes sense. Yeah. Thank you. You just mentioned the vast number of people you need to move forward with your study. And could we ask a little bit about 
how people get involved in your research, especially going forward. Yeah, absolutely. So we're just, the, the truth is we're designing these studies at the moment. And, um, and, and you know, I, I think we'll be in a position. So, yes, so we're designing them. I think we'll be in a position to come back for certainly for, for exercise and, re, um, and hopefully recruit people into that if they're interested in in hopefully a few weeks we're we're trying to put the funding together for that right now um you know as i said to you that the metabolite data is unpublished at the moment so we need to get the first thing we need to do is publish it and then uh that will give us the kind of uh, leverage to sort of launch that study um and i'll come back to you guys at that point because you know I, I what i i'm very aware of is that um you know, communities like Everything ALS are absolutely vital for the field to get anywhere. Um, yeah. Uh, so somebody said, so Jam Thomas, I think has had his hand up for a while. Um, yeah, so I, I'm seeing his question in the chat. It's talking about uh, marijuana use in ALS. So I don't know if that particularly pertains to your research, but if you would like to speak on it, you're more than welcome to. Um, it, it's up to you. I think, I think all I would say is that I guess I don't have any evidence either way. Um, it wasn't something we picked up in any of our metabolites. Th that doesn't mean that it, it's not. It just means that I don't know the answer. Um, but yeah. We appreciate that. Um, Jim, also feel if you have another question to continue to put them in the chat. I want to make sure that you're able to uh, get your questions answered. Our next question has to do with, do you know of any studies of people who have ALS that were involved in this strenuous frequent exercise that you were speaking of? have anything other than um, these metabolites in common that may allude to why they were at risk besides the exercise? Um, so, so, so the exercise is measured using a, so, so the, the, no, I don't have individual level data for those people. No, I, I don't have that. Okay. Do you know if there is research being done into um, exercise and, and, inducing or being a risk for, I guess is a better term, um, ALS or the use of exercise in ALS? Yeah, yeah, so absolutely. So so I was part of, um, a, a, there's some fantastic research on looking at the benefits of, of exercise, you know, with people who have ALS, um, you know, it, in terms of mobility and, and what exercise is good and what exercise is not. Um, and, and, and like I say, so our, our focus, you know, our next step is to, is to start measuring genetics and exercise going prospectively in, in patients and families, you know, and that, that's kind of where I'll come back to you in, in probably in a couple of weeks time. Like I say, we're at final stages of getting that funding together to launch that project, but I don't want to sort of promise something that I don't yet have, I can't yet say is, is you know, but, but yes, if, if everything goes as I hope it does, then I will be back in touch <laughs> because I think- Well, we know, definitely want to help in any way that we can, so. Yeah, oh, no, absolutely. And, and we need you to be fair, um, we need you guys. Our next question uh, was going back to the isoleucine. How exactly is are the levels of isoleucine measured? Yeah, good point. So, so, so different ways. So, um, uh, HPLC. So, so liquid chromatography is the kind of the most um, common way of measuring it, um, which is not trivial, and it's not something I've done myself. So, I'm relying on other people's, you know, study to measurements of this. Um, you know, I, I'm I'm more doing this sort of the statistics and the uh, you know the the genetics of it, it's putting it together. Um, but but yeah, so it's a but it is a standard technique for measuring levels of chemicals and within liquids. So it's it's not sort of you know. Um, uh, yeah, it, it's, it's not non-standard, if that makes sense. Um, the holotranscobalamin test um, that you were mentioning is seems to be only available in the UK. Is there a, a test equivalent that you know of that can be done in the United States? Yeah, there would be. I mean, I think B12 is, is a, um, so I, I, I haven't worked clinically in the US. Um, I think B12 itself is, is a good measure. You know, and is used frequently in clinical practice. So, so I think that it's a reliable measure. You know, I've shown you data suggesting that holotranscobalamin is is a more accurate measure. I think that's that's true. Um, but really, holotranscobalamin is just the active form of B12. So it's going to be very tightly correlated with B12. So I think you know, it's not. If 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 you go if you wanted to have your B12 measured, I'm sure your doctor could do that. That's not hard. 
Thank you. Our next question was in regards to families with a history of ALS, do you think people should be monitoring those three metabolites that you said showed statistical significance? Do I, do I think, I think, you know, like I said, the problem is, is, is taking it to an individual level. So, so I, you know, I wouldn't be recommending sort of close monitoring at the moment because I can't, you know, at the moment, I can't say for a specific individual what their effect on their individual risk or not risk or is. Um, so, so I, I, you know, I, yeah. So I, I think there's more to do on that. But I think, you know, what I think, like as you know, in both the, the exercise is the same. Like I think the, this this study shows that at a population level, there's an effect. So then we could take it forwards. Without this, you know, then you don't know if there's an effect. So you, you know, this kind of gives you the the, the platform to build from. Um, you talked that you looked at about a thousand different metabolites in general. Was any other um, B vitamin related metabolites come up come up with something important, or were they even tested? Yeah, yeah. So so lots of them were tested. Um, but because, you know, and if I, if I show you this, so it maybe makes the point better if I show you this again. Um, so there's this signal below this line, yeah? Um, You're not sharing so, your screen, hold on. Oh, oh, sorry. Um, Kara, is this the B1, B2 question that you Yeah. Are? Okay. Yeah. Can you see that? Yeah. Yes. So we tested, yeah, like I say, so we tested lots of, you know, all of the B vitamins. There is definitely signal below this line, but, 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 you know, given the way we did the test, these are the ones I'm sort of very, very confident in. These other ones, I, you know, haven't got the statistical power to say they're real or not real. Um, and, you know, if you look at the, the, the literature in, particularly in genetics, because genetics has been doing these, these kind of unbiased screens for a long time, you know, the minute anybody starts talking about stuff down here, then to, you know, a year later, there's another study that says the opposite. So I really don't want to, you know, it, it's, right. it's, it, it's a sort of a minefield for non-reproducibility. -reprodu but above this line, you know, we, we, we sort of confident that things tend to be reproducible. Okay. So the answer really to your question is, yes, we tested them. For some of them, there may be signal, but I couldn't say that confidently at the moment. Pooja, yeah. you're on mute. There you go. Oh, sorry. Um, our next question is, what would be the most beneficial metabolites for the post-diagnosis population? Would those be based on genetic analysis or would those apply to all ALS patients? Yeah, yeah, good, good, yeah. So the answer is probably it would based on based on genetic analysis. I think you know from our work at the moment, B twelve is is uh, it certainly looks like it's beneficial. Um, you know, I think and 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 the nice thing about B twelve is we know it, it's safe. Um, you know, so it's 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 certainly not going to do harm. Um, yeah, I guess that's where I get to. I think you know, bradykinin and estrogen you know, they, they are, there would be side effects. Um, and so I think, you know, given that, I think recommending that those are taken until we can understand individualized risk, it needs more work basically, you know. Um, a question that's kind of compiling from all the questions that are still in the chat. We know a lot of ALS patients do take B12 injections. That is a pretty common um, thing that people take. Great. Is there any um, additional thing that needs to be monitored in terms of absorption or um, is just taking the B12 sufficient enough to raise it to an adequate level? Yeah, yeah. So taking the injection will put it well up. Yeah, no, great. Um, basically, that's that's not, you know, once you have that injection, then you're actually talking about high dose B12. And, and yeah, that's that's fantastic. Um, yeah, it's really good. Great to hear that you guys, the, the, there's big uptake. Yeah, that's fantastic. So in the UK, the, you know, some people have high dose B12, but it's certainly not common. Um, that's that's great. All right. Well, it looks like in terms of questions, um, that is all that we have this evening. We so thank you for your time, especially with the time zone difference. We appreciate you being willing to um, come and speak with us. And I know everyone here, as well as myself, got a lot of out of this talk and definitely will be watching it again to... Uh, 
learn more and, and read more and understand more. So um, thank you again. And uh, we will look forward to hearing from you, hopefully in the future, to either participate in the study or, or a study and um, see where else your research can go. Great. Thanks, guys. Thanks for having me. It's, a, it's an absolute pleasure and great work. Keep it up. It's, it's thank great. you. Cheers, guys.